others that may be on our hearts and just ask that you'd be with each and every one you know some are having surgeries or health problems and tests and everything so we pray for them and pray for healing for a good result lord be with us all the events coming up for thanksgiving and christmas and just pray to be a time of rejoicing and blessings and that you bring visitors to our church and help us have a good crowd for the thanksgiving meal so lord just bless our time tonight we ask it all in jesus name amen, amen. all righty well i thought it'd be interesting to talk about uh, the lord's ministry around the sea of galilee if you look on the on a map i don't have one for you but you see the Sea of Galilee at the top of it, kind of the top left of it. There's an area that's called the Evangelical Triangle. And it goes from Gennesaret, which is on the west side, up to Chorazin, which is not, not far away at all, and then back down to Bethsaida. So it's like a triangle, just right on the top of uh, the Sea of Galilee, almost like a little hat. You know, a lot of things happen there. The Lord you know, worked many miracles and healings and teachings. And you know, a lot of people came to believe in him through his ministry there. So Capernaum was his headquarters. Uh, of course, his hometown was Nazareth. But uh, he uh, kind of established his headquarters, his ministry headquarters in Capernaum. And so a lot of things happened. There's a synagogue there that... Uh, is on the, the original site where the Lord taught and he cast a demon out of a young boy there and, and worked miracles. And so uh, that particular synagogue, of course, is no longer there, but the ruins of the one that was built above it, I think, in the second century. So it's really a cool place to visit. Um, but lots of things happened around the Sea of Galilee. You know, a lot of things happened in Jerusalem near the temple. But a lot of things happen in the Lord's ministry, you know, up around the Sea of Galilee. So in your outline, we've got a little introduction here. Um, sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake located in the northern hills of Israel. The place name Galilee means circle, circle. So that's where the name Galilee comes from. It's uh, 13 miles north and south and about eight miles wide at the east and west distance. So that's really big. I can't remember one time I compared it to Lake Meredith and much, much bigger you know, than Lake Meredith. It's a big lake, it really is. Maybe that's why they call it the Sea of Galilee, because it's so big. Uh, surface of the water is about 700 feet below sea level. So it's very low, it's kind of like a bowl. It's got mountains around it. And so it's the lowest uh, freshwater lake on the planet. You know, down south, about 60 miles or so, 70 miles south, uh, following the Jordan River, you've got the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea is the lowest saltwater lake on the Earth. It's 1,300 feet below sea level. It's the lowest place on Earth. So anyway, it's interesting that both of those bodies of water are the lowest, you know, for freshwater and saltwater. Uh, the lake is fed primarily by what river? Jordan, Jordan River. The Jordan River feeds it, and then the Jordan River continues on down to the Dead Sea. And the water that flows from the north comes from Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon uh, is about 9,000 feet in elevation, so it has snow on it almost year-round. <clears throat> so the snow melts, and a lot of that feeds into the Jordan River and into the Sea of Galilee. Also, there's a lot of spring water um, in the area of, around the foothills of Mount Hermon. And all of that kind of converges into the Jordan River and comes in from the north and feeds it. So, last time I was there, back in June, the water level was really high. It was way, way up. But uh, it's probably still much lower than it was during the time of Christ. You know, they, use a, they use all that for, for irrigation, and they use it for drinking water for the whole country. So you can imagine uh, they use quite a bit of water. So the levels probably dropped significantly from what they were in back in the time of Christ. They use that for seeing Yeah, it's not very much. Um, <coughs> so just last year you saw it. 
so much tourism and there's a lot of the you know the tourist boats that go out and so probably not a lot of skiing activity and stuff like that because of that I would think I'm not sure if there's regulations or what that's a good question I've always wondered because you never hardly see come up quickly on it what's that and the storms come up quickly? they can yeah because of its uh, you know being so low like that the winds can come whipping down pretty quickly and so storms can come up pretty quick you know fairly quickly uh, but I think it would probably have enough notice you know, if they were out on the lake to, to not, not to do any water activities or anything. It's really beautiful. It's a very beautiful lake. Um, so there's other names in the Bible, you may recall, um, for the Sea of Galilee. One of them is Chinnereth. So it spells C-H-I and then two N's. E-R-E-T-H. Chinnereth. And that's an Old Testament name. Chinnereth is a word that means heart shape. So some people think it kind of looks like a heart. Uh, another name is Gennesaret. Let me spell that for you. G-E-N-N-E-S-A-R-E-T. Gennesaret. And that comes from the name of a village that's on the western side, kind of up north on the Sea of Galilee. It's mentioned in the Bible. And there's one other name. Can anybody think of what that would be? The Galilee, Chinnereth, Gennesaret. Named after an emperor. Tiberius. Sometimes it's called Lake Tiberius in the Bible. Yeah. You know, the village of Tiberius is on the western shoreline. <clears throat> Still there today. <clears throat> and... Uh, also named after the Roman emperor that reigned from 14 to 37 AD. Caesar Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar. So anyway, there's no record in the New Testament of Jesus ever visiting Tiberius. I don't know why he may have, but it's not mentioned. Uh, there's a big cemetery there at the time and some things that maybe as a rabbi that most of the rabbis would not go to a place where there's a huge cemetery uh, because of defilement, things like that. But it's interesting, the Lord condemned several other villages. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida, because of, they didn't believe any. Woe unto you, Capernaum. All of those are ruins now, what's left of them. But he did not curse Tiberius, and Tiberius is a big city now. There you go. Any questions about that, anybody? That's pretty big, isn't it? 13 miles by 8 miles. Pretty good size. I was thinking, if he, weren't there like three towns that he mainly, his ministry was around, and it was around, so that's bigger than I thought. He had mm -hmm. to travel a long way yeah. from one point to the next. That's why they would get in a boat and travel instead of walking all the way around the lake. Because it could take quite a while, you know, even from Beth like Bethsaida, which is on the northeastern side, all the way around to Magdala. Magdala is on the western side, kind of up north, just before you would get to Tiberias. So not a whole lot of activity down south at all. Uh, almost everything's up north, along the northern shoreline. But didn't they get in the boat and turn to the other side to get away from the crowd and the crowd mm -hmm. beat them around there? Yeah, that's probably from Bethsaida, <laughs> which is kind of north, north, eastern side over to the western side. But everything's kind of up toward the northern end of the lake. You know, he did go over to the Gadarenes, we're going to look at that in a minute, which is probably a little bit farther south on the western side, but not, I'm sorry, the eastern side, but not, not too far south. So that as I mentioned, that triangle, that evangelical triangle is up north. That seems to be where all the activity, much of it, took place. Well, I thought we'd look at a few things, about five different areas here of things that happened, and also we'll read the passage and then fill in the blanks here. But uh, the first one is the great catch of fish. Remember when he called his disciples? So let's just look at, let's look at Luke 5. 
beginning at verse 4. This is where the Lord calls his first disciples. Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. So it says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep to the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So clearly this was a miracle. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch people, or you will fish for people. So they pulled their nets up on shore and every, left everything and they followed him. So that's the calling of uh, you know, Peter and Andrew and James and John. I think Andrew's mentioned in this passage. But anyway, I, I want to read that because I wanted to look at the parallel passage. Well, that's not a parallel passage, but the passage in John here is after the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so look at John chapter 21. And first seven verses. Very similar. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. So the passage in Luke is when he first called his disciples. And then here in John is after his resurrection. It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Does that sound familiar? Same thing happened, what, three years earlier. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And he swam to shore and pulled the fish ashore and all of that, so... So you see the significance there? Why, why did Peter go back to fishing? What was that all about? He did a little bit at first. Yeah. What had happened? What did he do that got him in trouble? He you denied know? Jesus three times. Three times. Denied knowing him. Yeah, three times. He said he didn't even know mm -hmm. who Jesus was. And so he felt disqualified. He felt like he couldn't continue to serve the Lord. And so when he says, I, I'm going to go fishing, it doesn't mean he's just going to go out for a fishing trip. This is what he did for a living before he began to follow the Lord. So in the Luke passage, it said they left everything. They left all their stuff, and they just started following Jesus for three years, their families and everything. Now, they came back on occasion, but for the most part, they were probably gone from their families. And so he felt like he could no longer continue and because he had uh, you know disobeyed the Lord and, and and denied the Lord. Um, so Jesus did the very same thing he did three years earlier. Uh, he met with them there on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and they were fishing. They didn't catch anything. So throw your net out on the other side. And they caught all those fish. In fact, he even tells the number, doesn't it? Somewhere in there. If we'd read a little farther. So 153. Wow. It's pretty, pretty specific, isn't it? Yeah. So a lot of fish. And so clearly this was the Lord's reaching out to Peter and you know drawing him back in as his disciple. Peter was very much a leader, you know, very 
very outgoing, very uh, impulsive, very charismatic. And so the Lord needed him, wanted him to be a leader for the disciples. And so he reached out to him. Doesn't he do the same thing for us? When we stray away from the Lord, we stumble. We all do, don't we? The Lord loves us and calls out to us. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us and convicts us. And, you know, tries to draw us back into that closer fellowship with the Lord. That's a beautiful thing. Isn't it? Okay, well, look at your paragraph here in your outline. It says, on both occasions, the disciples had fished all night long and caught nothing. But on the occasion, Jesus used this miracle, on the first occasion, to demonstrate his power before the disciples so that they might have faith in him as the Messiah. Y'all remember what the name Messiah, the title Messiah means? That's Hebrew. It's the same as the Greek word Christ. Very same meaning. It means the anointed one. So all of the Jews were looking for the, the Messiah to come, the Savior, you know, to deliver them from their enemies and all that. He had been prophesied, of course, in the Old Testament scriptures. And so they he's showing through his miracles and teaching that he is the Messiah. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And on the second occasion, Jesus was calling the disciples back into service. Peter felt unworthy to serve the Lord after his denials prior to the crucifixion. And the other disciples were following his lead. I just have a question here. Why do you suppose the disciples did not immediately recognize Jesus? It says they didn't recognize him. He was on the shore. This was after the crucifixion. They didn't think it was, they didn't think it was him. Okay. That's interesting. Him. Was that? They weren't expecting him. Okay. They were yes. I don't know. He had told them to go ahead of him up into Galilee, so they knew he had been resurrected and everything. Uh, he had already appeared, of course, you know, in Jerusalem to them on two occasions: the first Sunday and the next Sunday, when Thomas was there. Um, it's very interesting. It's, some say, well, he was hundred. We know he's hundred yards. Um, Offshore, because it mentions that, that Peter swam 100 yards. When's the last time you swam 100 yards? <laughs> That's a pretty good swim. And, yeah. But uh, you would think even 100 yards off, you could recognize somebody you know. I would think. It's interesting because I got two of the references there. We don't need to look them up. But the first one in John 20 is when Mary Magdalene was the very first one to see Jesus in the garden uh, uh, after his resurrection. Uh, not the Garden of Gethsemane, but the garden where he was buried. And uh, she didn't recognize him. Now, it's, it might have been dark, you know. But it's, who did she think he was? Remember? The gardener. She thought he was the gardener. And it says she looked at him and she said, Can you tell me where you put him and I'll, I'll come and get him? And then he called her name. And when she heard his voice, he said, Mary. And then she realized that. Yeah. And the road to the now, the one in Luke's passage is the two men on the road to Emmaus. And they didn't recognize him. There it clearly says it was kept from them. They were prevented from recognizing Jesus. What do you think that was all about? Any thoughts on that? He was curious of what they were saying. Okay. He wanted to kind of have some time to talk to them. It says he explained from the Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah and all of that. So they had quite a conversation. And then it's interesting when they got to Emmaus, which is not far from uh, Jerusalem, he acted like he was going to continue to go on. And they talked, oh, no, come and stay with us. You know, they, he kind of drew them in, you know, in their discussions. And so he did stay with them. And then when he blessed the food and broke the bread and handed it to them, suddenly they recognized him. So it was, the Lord intentionally prevented them from recognizing him immediately. So that could be what it is. Maybe uh, the Lord is using that for more time to get, help them have greater understanding, maybe. or I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. He plays hide and seek with us sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I know when I was doing children's sermon, I would sit on Saturday night and have it all worked out and everything. Next morning I'd get up, I couldn't find my book, and it was like, i got to come up with something <laughs> right quick. And when we get back home, there would be laying right there on the coffee yeah. table where I left it. Yeah. But I did not see it. Right. <laughs> but Sometimes the Lord does things that yeah, are kind of odd. The to lesson that He gave me that morning 
was better than the one that yeah. I can work on myself. Okay. Well, it's like when you move through the crowd too. You know, they're going to start him and be like, remember, he's like, through the crowd, like they didn't even know. Right. So it is kind of how he can. Yeah, it's interesting. So. Yeah. It's just giving them more time to uh, have greater understanding of everything that happened and comprehend it before they fully recognize him. Or, some of, some people maybe they would be such a shock, you know, to see him, and so maybe you want to give them a little bit of time to, to prepare themselves, I guess. But uh, I don't know. It's very interesting. It's kind of we don't really know. Okay, so that's the great catch of fish. The first one and the, the second one, three years apart. Then the the teaching from the boat. Let's just look in Matthew, Matthew 13. And verse, uh, verses 1 and 2 should be. So Jesus is uh, at the Sea of Galilee. Matthew 13, 1 and 2. It says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. This is probably a Capernaum. And such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it why all the people stood on the shore. And so he taught them from the boat, pushed out a little bit from the shore. I think we're told in the, one of the other passages that it was Peter's boat. So this is most likely Capernaum. Uh, why do you think he did that? Why did he teach from the boat? Probably because he could see more people and they could see him. And on that lake, it, his voice was amplified probably. Got it. I read something like that, and I can't remember, but I read something about that. Yeah, so I don't think he pushed out very far. Mm -hmm. Thing is, it would it would prevent the crowd from surrounding him because they're not going to wander out here in the lake, probably. Mm -hmm. right? the lake. Well, the thing. Some of them might have, but uh, not too far they won't. You know? no. So he's out there just sitting in the boat, so they could all gather up close to the shoreline, but they wouldn't crowd him. And it could be something to do with the acoustics. I don't know. It kind of it kind of ramps up from there and starts kind of going uphill, you know, like an amphitheater. Uh, when Jesus preached, I've often wondered: Do you think that there's anything supernatural about the people's ability to hear him? You think he just it was just a normal, just spoke in a normal voice, and everybody heard him naturally, or do you think there was a supernatural aspect to it? There was no amplification like we have today. When Jesus speaks, it would be super. Yeah. You know, when I, if you if you're like standing down in a football field, probably, and you're talking like I am now, someone up the stand stands by not going to hear you. You'd have to yell pretty loud. I don't know. It's I've often wondered if there was any kind of a supernatural thing to it, where everybody he could just kind of talk normally and they would hear it. Yeah. They may not have even been aware that that was going on. I think it has to be because it said there's like 5,000 people, you know, the yeah. fish on, so that's a lot of people. Probably a big crowd, yeah, for this. So. Yeah, and at the Sermon on the Mount, sure. So it's just interesting to think about. Okay, well, back in your outline here, uh, large multitudes of people would gather to hear Jesus teach. Rabbis would generally sit while teaching. Today, most speakers stand. But in that day, rabbis would sit. People would gather around him. And the boat would have prevented the people from crowding Jesus. And perhaps the crowd's hearing was amplified in a supernatural way to allow the people to hear clearly. So it might have been a little bit of a miracle of the ears, possibly, I don't know. Uh, throughout his Galilean ministry, Jesus taught in what? Parables. Parables. What is a parable? A story. Yeah, it's, it's an earthly story. It's a story that has uh, yeah. a meaning. It teaches uh, the truth. Well, what's, what's so powerful about parables? Certain preachers call them illustrations. You know, tell story. It's about our life. I mean, he uses things that are that pertain, pertain to our life. Okay. Yeah. Well, back then, like farming and sowing. Yeah. yeah like he would use the things around him, like agricultural things, or the birds of the air. Mentioned that in the parable uh, teaching. So uh, 
Yeah, it would be more interesting. It would be easier to remember, right? Sometimes if I tell a story about something, when people are leaving, they'll, they'll bring that up. That's the one thing they remember, you know, is the story. So I think that's got something to do with it. I've written in my Bible here, it says, an earthly study with a heavenly meaning. Okay, yeah, just a story that has a teaching behind it. Uh, Jesus appears to have used them to obscure the truth from unbelievers while making it clearer to his disciples. That's how the Matthew passage here, you can look that up later. He talks about how he says, you know, I, they asked him, why do you teach in parable all the time? He said, well, I do that so that so that you'll understand what I'm saying, but others won't. You know, the lost people, the unbelievers, they wouldn't understand what he's talking about. Kind of interesting. Okay. A third occasion here is when Jesus calmed the sea. Matthew chapter 8. Beginning at verse 28. And this is when he went to the, uh, the other side of the lake. In the Gadarene area where the demonic, the demon possessed man was at, the Moniac, we call it. Uh, verse 28 says, When he arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes, uh, two demon possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, Son of God? they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from him, a large herd of pigs were feeding, and the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went to the town, and reported all this, including what they had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and they, when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. They were afraid. Um, so this happened over on the eastern side of the lake. It's the Gentile area. It's where the Gentiles lived. Uh, you know, Sunday I mentioned this city up on a hill named Hippus. Hippus is a little farther south. But that was all a, that was all a Gentile area. Hippus was a decapolis city. And so the Gadarenes, and there's several names that are used in uh, the different references here. Um, Gadarenes is the name that uh, is in Matthew, but also uh, the Gergesenes is mentioned, or Gerasenes. It's all the same general area. Uh, just referring to that Gentile area over there on the eastern side. So Matthew here informs us that there's two demon-possessed men, while Mark and Luke just focus on one. So obviously the one was more impressive than the other one. Uh, a Roman legion, when Jesus asked him his name, he said, Legion. And so a Roman legion was comprised of about 6,000 soldiers. 6,000 soldiers make up a legion. And Mark informs us that there were 2,000 pigs in the herd. So obviously there were a lot of demons in the man, right? We don't know how many, but quite a few. That's interesting, isn't it? That a person can be possessed by more than one demon. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Luke tells us that the demons asked to be cast into the pigs rather than the abyss. A-B-Y-S-S. -S. We talked about that here a while back when we talked about hell. Which is probably a reference to Tartarus where a particular group of fallen angels await final judgment. That's in 2 Peter 2, 4. So these particular angels that have sinned are being held in Tartarus, which is probably the abyss, the lower level of Hades, until the day of judgment. And I think they'll be released. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the locusts, the locusts coming up from the pit. I think that could be a reference to the demons that are coming up you know, from, from the abyss. 
So what does that tell you about the, the demons not wanting to go there? It must be a pretty bad place. Please, please don't send us there. Let, let us go into the pigs. You know? And we talk about this before. It's kind of strange. That the Lord granted their request. Then the pigs run off into the cliff, into the water and drown. And so then the demons are released again. But the Lord didn't make them go to the abyss. He even had grace for the demons. Isn't that something? That's interesting. Isn't it? At one time, they were they were holy angels, you know, who disobeyed the Lord and followed after Lucifer, after Satan. So anyway, okay, yeah, you, they've got a place, uh, Mark, uh, a place called Cursa, Cursi, I believe it is, Cursi, yeah, C U R S I, I believe it's over there on the eastern shoreline. We visited. There, there's an old ancient church there. And that's the traditional site where the pigs ran off the cliff into the water. There's a lot of hills up in there, and there's caves up in there. It said that these men lived in caves. And you remember what they did? It's not mentioned here, but Matthew, what did they do themselves? These men that were demon possessed. They cut themselves. Yeah, they were cutting themselves. Why would they do that? The portraits. Yeah, the demons inside them were making them abusing themselves uh, they were in agony maybe for one thing physical agony also they had superhuman strength so they tried to bind them with chains and they could break the chains so these demons gave them incredible strength and power uh, so demons are very scary and, you know, I certainly believe that's still happening today why do you think we don't seem to see as much of that today do you think they put a different label on it yeah, it's they got a mental. There's a diagnosis of that now. Okay. Yes. Some things are demon possession and they're called something else. Maybe. Yeah. I think about are all mental diseases because of. I don't things? think so. I don't think so. I don't know. No. no I think some. I think so yeah, some mental okay. ailments would not be demon possession. But, uh, I do know that the, the kids that were a little off or whatever. They were really strong, and it took a lot to take oh, them yeah. down. Yeah. We had to take them down. Yeah. So it was okay. Yeah. Could be some of that. I think also there have been periods of time where there's a greater there's greater supernatural activity than others. The Bible indicates that, you know, from time to time. And so certainly when Jesus was on the earth in the flesh and walking around, there was a tremendous amount of uh, demonic activity, Satan rebelling and rejecting against. The ministry of Christ. So that could be one reason why there was more of it then, maybe, than there is now. Possibly. Right now. Yeah, yeah, now. I think it's yeah. ramping up again. Yeah. And maybe we become too sophisticated you know, to to uh, to be threatened by such things. And I hear that there's more of that kind of activity in third world countries and places mm -hmm. like that where there's less like Haiti. sophistication. Yes, and yeah. The witchcraft, voodoo, and all this stuff. South like Africa. Uh, Trevor talked about it. Yeah, right. You know, back when they were, Trump made the comment and got a lot of ridicule about the, the Haitians eating the dogs and cats. Yeah, they yeah. were. They are. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, I had a, a James Dennison, he has a blog I read every morning, and he mentioned, he said, he said, people don't know that in Haiti, their religion is voodoo, mm -hmm. and they have communal meals where they'll eat these animals as a you know, kind of a cult-like activity. And so he says it's quite likely that yeah. these people from Haiti would do that. They'd see a stray dog, but hey, mm -hmm. they'd take it and they'd kill it, and they'd have a religious kind of a sacrifice kind of thing and eat it. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just eating it just because they're hungry. It was kind of part of their religion. That's right. So if you had a whole bunch of Haitians move into your neighborhood, you might thin out your dogs and cats a little bit, you know. That's what my friend out in Haiti Street said. Don't touch my dogs or cats. That's what my friend that lived in East Street said. You don't see very many stray dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't. I remember that. So, yeah. I remember hearing that. When the Orientals first came, yeah. that went on a lot. Yeah. Right. I don't know if they're still doing that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think they've learned better. That, might, that probably wasn't a religious thing. It was more just, just what they told That's what they, they ate. Really they ate dogs. Yeah. Some people do. Yeah. Oh, dog, I like hot dog. Hot dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will not let Squirt watch this. He does not need to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dog. I'm upset. Oh, dog. Oh, all right, so uh, talk about the Lord, the great, the great catch of fish, teaching from the boat, calming the sea. Um, I jumped that one, didn't I? I thought I was going off fast here. I jumped over one. Let's back up here. Go back up to Jesus calms the sea. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 8. We're still in Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Okay, says, then uh, this is after the feeding of the 5,000. It says, uh, he got into the boat with his disciples, they followed him, and suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, oh, you little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. It says the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So the calming of the sea. So like Doc mentioned earlier, sometimes it could come up really quick, a storm on the Sea of Galilee. The winds could really start howling. They call it Sharkia, Sharkia winds. And that happened one time when I was, uh, we, we always stay on the, on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee in this little uh, resort type area. It's a beautiful little place and uh, little cabanas and palm trees and stuff. One night that, that just kicked up out of nowhere and started blowing and you know and I've lived here most of my life. I know what a strong wind is you know around here but the, I mean it, this was something in, in these big old tall eucalyptus trees huge tall trees were just bending over. I thought they were going to break and this went on for like 24 hours and all of a sudden it just quit. So it came up just out of nowhere and you know strong winds and then it just suddenly stopped. It's kind of a weird deal. That's like the, the Chinook winds in uh, Colorado. Oh yeah. It comes over the over the uh, mountains and swoops down here. Yeah. yeah. Something Fierce about winds. being up down low, the lake being so low like that, and surrounded by the hills can make it make yeah. the winds really pick up. Yeah, my brother talks about the Santa Ana winds. He lives in California. They're terrible. Yeah. yeah. He's living to stake. And I was out there one time. I said, I will never complain about Arrow, Texas wind again. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. All right. Well, look at your paragraph there under the calming of the sea. Uh, because of its location below the mountain peak, storms can arise quickly on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus used the occasion to rebuke his followers for their lack of faith. Uh, no matter what we face, Jesus is with us and has a solution. Uh, the event also served to strengthen the disciples' faith in the Lord because of his amazing power over nature. Mm -hmm. so, opportunity for the Lord to work a miracle. Yeah. Suddenly it was just very calm. I think that the wind was blowing and the waves were tossing and it was just, they, and these, most of these guys were fishermen. They were scared to death. So I'll tell you how bad it was. And I think when he got up and said, peace be still, it was just completely still. Dramatic. Talk about dr drama. Just, I mean, like a mirror. You know, there's no waves at all. And so clearly, they were impressed. They now they were afraid of him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it still amazes me how they can all hear him talk. Mm -hmm. You know, so many. Yeah. 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 I think there's something supernatural about that. I do. I think so. Okay. Last one. Jesus walks on the water. Matthew 14. And verse 22. It says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go to, ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. This may be after the feeding of the 4,000, isn't it? Looking back here to see. It doesn't say. After the oh, it's after the 5,000. All right. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. 
Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, let me come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and being beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Okay. So, very similar to the calming of the, the sea, uh, but this is different. Uh, in your outline, I mentioned here, Jesus apparently would often go off by himself to spend time in prayer. That's mentioned in Mark's Gospel. Why do you think he did that? Why do you think the Lord would go off by himself and pray? I mean, he's God. Why would he do that? We'd like to go off and talk to the Lord by ourselves, or we like to go off and talk to our parents or our children by themselves. Okay. It's interesting. Uh, clearly it shows the Trinity of, of, of the Lord, of God the Son, talking to God the Father, two, two members of the Trinity. Um, that they're distinct and different. It's just an example for us to, yeah. to yeah. go yeah. off alone where there's no... Distraction. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, there was no one around, because he was always hounded by crowds. So he got off by himself. And so he sent his disciples off after the feeding of the 5,000. He sent them off, and he stayed. He must have prayed for quite a while uh, before he started walking on the water. In fact, your next sentence there is the fourth watch of the night, we're told. Fourth watch of the night would have been, would have been between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Starts at 6 p.m. and then every three hours is a, is a watch of the night, four watches of the night for a 12 hour period. So he was praying quite a while, wasn't he? Several hours. Most of us don't pray for several hours at a time, do we? So it was dark and it was also windy. Now, what would you think if you're in that boat and just tossing around your things about three o'clock in the morning? You look up, and here comes somebody walking on the water. I believe I'd jump out of the boat into the water. Didn't think on the other side. Right. How do you think he walked on it? If it's, since it's tossing like this and everything, how's he able to walk on the water? He just glided. He's Jesus. Didn't he? That's right. he just, but didn't they believe that Satan was underneath the water in the depths of the sea? I don't know about that. I've never heard that before. Maybe. Oh, that's what I heard with the, about the abyss that they they were afraid of the depths of the sea because of hmm. the Hmm. I didn't have heard that. I have to evil. I think I have heard that before. Yeah. Huh. So, so yeah. yeah, it's not in scripture, but clearly it's supernatural. If he can walk on the water, he can certainly walk on rough water, can't he? That's no problem. So. Yeah, he's always pictured him like walking calmly, you know, but what do you think with this? He was probably just kind of, you know. It wasn't a problem for him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, if I've been where he was, it was calm. Maybe. He, he kind of brought it. Yeah. But then when Peter got out of the boat, it was so cool. <laughs> yeah. So, as you might imagine, the disciples were terrified when they saw Jesus walking in the water. And Jesus, again, used the occasion to de demonstrate his power over nature and bolster the disciples' faith in him as the Messiah. Wow. That's interesting about Peter, too. Peter. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, he's always one of the best the Lord. He's really going to be there. Come on. So, he's the first one to say, Lord, I don't know if you're going to be there. And then he got scared. Started looking around, and he started singing. He cried. 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 He
time we'll, uh, of course, we're skipping next the next two. But when we meet again here, what, three weeks? Or is that right? We'll talk about uh, when Jesus uh, talked with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. He said, who do men say I am? We'll, we'll talk about that. Next Wednesday's the meal, and then we're going to skip the next one because it's the day before Thanksgiving. Two, no, not going to meet the next two Wednesdays. Yeah. I think that's where you're going to have to sign up.